Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Africa Box Report, episode 291. I am your host, Michael. Uh, joining me this week, uh, Gail from Community Digital News, Daniel from the Inscriber. What's going on, lady and gent? Keeping it clean, keeping it clean. <laughs> Trying to, keeping it clean and keeping myself from not getting As much as we can. This, right, <laughs> and try to keep myself uh, focused while watch, while listening, or watching, I should say, this uh, Jada Kiss and Fabulous Versus battle. <laughs> so my apologies if I'm basically <laughs> distracted through the recording of this. Um, normally, we're joined uh, by Jacob of Jab Hook Boxing. Um, for those who don't know, uh, due to uh, the pandemic, he was unfortunately laid off, but he's recently uh, found employment again. The problem is that because of the hours of his new job, uh, he will not be able to be back on the show for the time being. So I wanted to give a shout out to Jacob number, Jacob number one. Um, congrats and best of luck on, on, on finding the new job, the new gig. And um, whenever you have time to come back, uh, open invitation, um, as always. Uh, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, uh, podcast, and blog discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. Um, Want to find out all information regarding the show? The blog page is the place to go to for the time being. P4PBoxerReport.wordpress.com. Um, if you check the top right of the blog page, you'll find them links to where to find us all over social media, where to find us on all uh, platforms that carry RSS feed that distribute podcasts, where you can donate the links to my online coaching page i am an online coach for beachbody.com or if you're checking us out live here on youtube or we checking out later checking the show out later on youtube just hit that subscription box and all of the same information is below and um if you have the time please check us out on itunes and spotify subscribe like um i interviewed uh main events promoter main events boss owner uh owner ceo kathy duva i did a live interview uh with her on friday this past friday um today is the 29th of this recording on june the 29th of uh, that interview took place on the 26th if you check the out pound for pound box report on itunes on spotify uh that avenue uh, you can check out the live. You can check out the interview with Kathy Do it there as well as the interview I conducted a couple of weeks back with um, Susie Ramadan, uh, former WBC IBF Women's Bantamweight World Champion. Um, I'll probably I'll try to upload the Duva and the Ramadan um, interviews here on the YouTube page, but for the time being, uh, uh, take some time out and check out the interview, particularly the interview with. Um, Kathy Dill, who was dropping some real jewels in terms of how things are conducted behind the scenes on the business side. Let's, with those issues out the way, let's get to talking about these fights that took place last week. Um, top rank cards, or top rank associated cards, I should say. Uh, let's begin with the, the Maloney brothers, um, focusing on Andrew Maloney specifically. And I'm going to you on this one, Gail. Uh, when we, previewed the fight last week uh you kind of hinted that um andrew maloney in particular may be in a bit of some trouble here he may find the may find it a tough go and it certainly proved out to be that case um as maloney lost his um interim world junior bantamweight title um, to franco um lost by decision was knocked down i believe in the process and um since you the one who was who basically suggested that this could happen uh talk about it gail your thoughts having some few days having a few days to ponder about the fight this fight proves why these young guys like joshua franco need to be testing themselves against tougher opposition because yes they may take a loss but they get so much better his trilogy with Oscar Negrete leading to this, for which he they had a draw and then he uh, won the two subsequent fights, but they were all squeakers. They were all wars. 
he learned so much from that. I mean, he should be sending Oscar some kind of nice thank you present for getting him ready for this fight because it toughened him up. It taught him a lot. It taught him what he could take, you know, what he could see himself through. And he was not going to let Andrew Maloney get to him. He was far busier. He stood right in there and he, he actually scored two knockdowns to the point that you know, Maloney really needed a knock knockout by the end of the fight, by the last few rounds, that that wasn't going to happen. He connected with Franco from time to time, but he didn't really do him any serious damage. It was a great performance for Franco. Maloney, obviously very disappointed. This was not hit the American debut that he dreamed of. But these are the kind of matchups we need to see more often. I hope as boxing sort of warms up its pandemic routine, as it's starting to now, we've seen cards now being added by Matchroom Boxing um, in several locations, which is good news for fans. I think they need to learn that we need to see this. And if you watched last week's UFC card versus the... Um, Zanfer slash top rank card Saturday, you know, there was no comparison. And you don't need to be a big UFC fan to acknowledge that these guys needs to be these guys need to be matched tougher and they need to not worry so much about taking a loss because it pays off. You need to sharpen the saw. And that's when a guy like Joshua Franco learns, you know, improves and gets to shine. And here he is, world champion. Um, I'll go to you and to you, Daniel. But uh, and you can talk about the fight certainly. But Gail just talked about how uh, the fact that Franco was matched tough made him a better fighter and helped prepare him uh, for this quote unquote upset against against um, Andrew Maloney. Yeah. In a strange way, could this defeat by Maloney help him in the process, kind of help him in the same way that the tough battles help uh, uh, the guy who defeated him? It really depends on how how he takes it in, uh, Maloney, because he did, when he, you heard the decision, you saw how crestfallen he was when it came to the announcement of it. Pretty much stayed there more than 30 seconds after the decision. You know, he hung his head, and then he he walked out. He did it years afterwards, hoping to really can do better. And these are the tests that you need. As a fighter, a weight division that is as hot and then has as many top tier opponents as 115. You need those type of fights because those are areas where you're not so much worried about the O, you're and not only a good fight, an exciting fight as well. And Jack. Joshua Franco took all advantage of that within the great fight. That's one of the things, honestly, that Golden Boy actually does pretty well. Like they know how to match up their guys and to see who can run through it. Because and they're willing to take a loss on a guy if he shows that he can come. They show it back of it because that win upended a lot of players. Fans that Bob had involving the Maloney brothers that cannot be fixed without a rematch. I certainly think a rematch is going to happen. Um, um, Franco, he's right into into the hundred into the mix at one hundred fifteen pounds. Um, I don't think he's on the level of an, an Estrada, uh, uh, a Roman, 
um, a, a Tanaka, a Nyoka, uh, or even a, a German Unconscious, I think all of them would beat him. Um, but there still is, as Daniel said, a rematch with um, a, a rematch against Andrew Maloney. And I'll ask both of you, um, how soon do you think that this rematch will happen? Do you think they will run it back ASAP or do you think that um, do you think that Franco may try to squeeze out a fight or two here or there? You know, it kind of depends on what Golden Boy can tee up for him and how bad, how quickly they get back to business. Obviously, they like to have Franco on their stage if they could, but if it's not possible, yeah, you know, let's see if Top Rank can tee something else up for him. I think that would probably mean a rematch and he really got away with very little wear. I don't think he'd want him back again right away, but quite a few of the other fighters fighting the six and eight round fights are coming right back on the schedule. I mean, right back on the schedule, kind of amazing. Clay Collard's coming right back. Um, Robesai is coming right back, Ramirez. So Rango could come back, but Golden Boy will get the first option. And they have now scheduled their first card for late in July. So, you know, they may want to see someone like Franco. Oh, who knows? Could be on a Canelo undercard later in the fall. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on, on mute. Um, your thoughts, Daniel, on the future of these two? Do you think they'll run it back ASAP or uh, uh, is it kind of out of their control? It depends really first on what Malo on what the Maloney brothers want to do. Really are set to probably make a foothold in the U.S. And particularly right now, with everything that's happening, they have to do it. To stay here and then be able to train because we have to remember, that wasn't a cut cave fight. They, that was a pretty tough and he probably has to recover a little bit. Top rank actually does have options as well when it comes to Franco. So it really who gets the better offer. If it's going to be Oscar, if it's going to be Bob, if it's more pertinent than at rematch, with, rematch with Maloney works better, then they might do that faster. Or if by any chance, any chance, they try to get Franco with a tough opponent, or even if they really have confidence with the kid, try to do a unif even do a little bit of a unification fight. Then it all depends on what's going to happen. We said it last week also. The pandemic gets a vote on this too, so we have to see how everything shakes up. When it comes to dealing with this. Especially depending, like I said, it'll be, it'll be depending on the Maloney brothers that they're willing to stay in the country for the long term. You know, you read my mind, Daniel. I was just thinking, you know, if the Maloney's want their shot, they need to stick around. If they're going to go home to Australia and things blow up, especially here in the Southwest, that affects California and Nevada, eh, could be a problem. So then Golden Boy would certainly take over, get the nod. Would they put him up against Dan Cajas? I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate that. Wouldn't hate that at all. I will talk about Jason Maloney in a second, but I want to talk about another fight in the interim in between those two. And that is, um, sorry, I'm having some technical issues on my end. That is, uh, Christopher Diaz. Christopher Diaz, he lost a title attempt to Ito uh, uh, a couple of years ago in 2018. Yes. Uh, and he's on the way back. And he fought a uh, fighter by the name of Jason Sanchez. Uh, uh, Daniel, I'm going to you on this one first. Yes, Diaz, he got the win. And yes, he looked very good in getting, getting the win. But in the aftermath, he is talking a lot. And so, is his, so are his fans. Uh, he's talking a lot about how he's ready for any and everybody. He's talking about moving down to 122 pounds, and he feels that he could 
whoop up on anybody at that weight. The win was excellent, but are folks being a little bit too hyperbolic in terms of uh, uh, prognosticating his future and now how well he would fare, particularly at the top level, be it at 122 or 126 pounds? But it's uh, it's a case of the fact that it's a it's a combination of the fact that the how the victory was done and how good. And, and, and in short, and let me um excuse me for interrupting how, you, but in short, are folks being uh, uh, guilty of prisoner of the moment? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's a combination of that. And, like you see, the victory was very well. And it's also nothing else to watch right now. And when you have that happening, you're gonna you're gonna have people cling on to those the specific people that go into this moment. So it is that case people are trapped in the moment because they're not not a lot, a lot of moments out there. I think Daniel went out on on us, uh, uh, so I'll direct a question to you, to you, Gail. Yes, um, yes, he looked good, but are people just being a little bit over the top in their reaction to uh, 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 the fight, and, and especially the fighter himself talking about he can go down and just become a champion right now and just whoop any and everybody at a certain weight? Well, again, you know, we're looking at these guys in this prism of the time we're in and anybody who shows any talent at all right now you know gets us all excited because we don't have a whole lot of boxing to watch um he has looked good uh his experience certainly made the difference over sanchez um and you know he's fought almost twice the rounds of sanchez and against far better opposition Again, another guy made better by a loss, frankly. Um, he'd like to fight Jesse Magdaleno next. That's very possible. You know, everyone uh, will, will remind you Magdaleno um, lost a very messy bout by DQ the week before. Um, other than getting hit below the belt a whole lot and manhandled, he, he really came out of it fine. So... If Diaz is ready, Magdaleno is ready, they want to round robin these guys and shuffle them back into the mix. You know, they're used to the bowl, they get it, they're willing to play. I like that. I I like the fact that they've they've sort of got, you know, almost their contender or world super series sort of pool of guys, the mix and match. And um, I'd be fine with that. But yeah, everybody can sort of calm down. He's, you know, he he's He's good. He's he's doing well. He's not he's not elite. I think that's fair to say. He could be. We'll see. Uh, piggybacking, picking back, piggybacking on that. What you just said, Gil. If he's not elite, which I agree with you on that one. Um, where do you think he will he can go? Uh, particularly if he stays true. To what he said after the fight and, and and talking about moving down to to junior featherweight where to be fair there are better opportunities there's a he has he stands a better chance of becoming a world champion in my opinion at junior featherweight as opposed to featherweight it's probably why he's talking about it moving down to 122 pounds because he may not say it but he probably he knows in his heart that he can't deal with the guys at 126 pounds right now. He has no chance against Russell. He has no chances against Stevenson. Um, I don't think he has a chance against Warrington or even the length, the length and the activity of Kanzu. Well, he, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of pick your battles. I mean, yeah, 126, that's a problem. 130. That's starting to be a problem. I mean, could he move down? If he felt really good, you know, coming into this fight 
as far as training went. His training was short. He didn't have Freddie Roach with him. They had to actually train via FaceTime, which he said was awfully odd. I can only imagine, you know, he made it work. So if he's thinking, all right, if I had the chance to you know, get a little more gym time in, if he could make the weight, he still feels strong enough. Um, it's worth an experiment. If he wants to give it a try against, you know, a, a sturdy type opponent to see how he feels, you know, it's not, it's not a bad experiment, but um, I, I think he... I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. He claims he can go back and forth between 122 and 126. He said after the fight, you know, that at the weigh-in he was eating and drinking. He he would have no problem. He wants to be a champ in both divisions. First of all, I like ambition like that. I like to see it rewarded. I think it hurts him not one bit to give it a try. But... You know, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, I felt really good. I was eating and drinking. And another to actually get yourself down there and stay there and go through the weight and the diet and the discipline. You know, it's not a good time. So you better be motivated. We'll see. Um, I'm going back to you, Daniel, to talk about uh, the other Maloney brother, uh, Jason. Um, fought, fought by the name of Baez, right? And Gail was right about Andrew Maloney. I last week thought that Jason Maloney could be in a bit of trouble against the taller, longer Baez. And um, I was admittedly was dead damn wrong. Um, thanks, Sean, for joining us, for listening on the show. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please uh, don't be afraid to uh, mention them in the chat. I was dead damn wrong about uh, 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 Jason Maloney and, and, and Baez. I thought because Baez had been on a bit of a roll, and because of he's been trained by Joel Diaz, they may give him a better get give, give him some more juice. But it looks like Mal Maloney Jason was motivated by the loss of his brother, his twin brother Andrew, and he came out and handled business. Um, I love the way he uh, fought on the back and the front foot. Um, I love the combination punch into the, his head, to the head and body. He's stronger and has more power uh, than his brother, Andrew. Uh, he dominated from jump. And look, he lost to Emmanuel Rodriguez in 2018. But a win like this in the way that he won, that puts him right in the hunt for in, in, in the 118 pound uh, picture. He's right in there. He's right in line for a world title shot, in my opinion. Your thoughts? I did, did say last week that Jason Maloney was probably the better of the two Maloney brothers. And that fight showed it a little bit because immediately and throughout the fight did do the one thing that a lot really like to do when it comes to facing guys that are tall and rangy and that weight class, like the Epsilon mentioned it, the Ray Vargas is and Navaretes, the guys that make it this is a little bit too, which is try to go in deep and take away that advantage with a body attack. But Maloney did it. He went in. He grinded it out. He made sure the bias never running. And once he knew that bias really couldn't hurt him. He just he showed great range, good combinations. And like you mentioned, Mike, in the beginning when you talked, the motivation, like I said, more than likely because of his brother, because they didn't need either one of them was going to be like, you're going to have this big debut in these circumstances and then just have two losses in a row. But you obviously show that he has the grit, workload to do it, and he has the patience now. He didn't something he didn't have really well when he came to the fight with Rodriguez. 
not only probably get a good title shot at bantamweight, but probably get a, a good bantamweight title. There yet, but he's more ready than he's ever been. Absolutely, absolutely. At, at this point, this is one of the best performances of his career. Um, I don't care about the opponent in this instance, Gail, because of how how he fought in the form that he displayed. Um, your thoughts on the fight and your thoughts on 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 Jason moving forward. Um, we in the last episode we talked about uh, Joshua Greer getting upset by Plania. This Maloney beats both of them. Uh, dare I say, if he was to fight Casimiro, who's the WBO champion, I would lean towards Jason Maloney in that possible fight. Um, I'm not going to say he beats Obali, but he, he gives him a hell of a fight. Um, I'm not ready to throw him in there against the likes of Inouye. But again, your recap of the fight and, and, and where do you see Jason Maloney moving up, uh, moving forward in the Bantamweight class? Yeah, Jason really distinguished himself, especially after Andrew's loss. And uh, Andrew commented, you know, I hope I didn't put too much pressure on him to win. Well, if he did, hey, maybe it was motivation. That's that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. His performance was, you know, light years ahead of his brother. And there are two really good options. Casimiro is a great option fight. And I think Plania is a great option, too. And I would imagine top rank, you know, I, I don't mean to be cruel saying this, it's just reality. I don't think top rank is particularly invested in Plania and wouldn't hesitate to toss him right in against Maloney. And I think that's a very interesting fight. And again, just like with Diaz and uh, Magdaleno, they kind of have this interesting stable of guys that they've carefully put together and now you can see down the road if they've got to continue this bubble situation for a while you know they've got this stable of guys they can sort of mix and match and it's working out shockingly well we've seen them both we know what they're about you can put them back together on the schedule later down the line these guys are all familiar with the protocol they kept their noses clean you know they seem to be able to function okay in within the circumstances. So I like that. He does need to stay away from Inouye. Everybody needs to stay away from Inouye. I mean, who are we kidding? Um, I would love to still see Inouye and Casimiro, but until the travel situation changes, that's not going to happen for a while. So next best thing, you know, you've got Magdaleno, you've got um, for uh, Diaz, and you've got either Casimiro or Plania for uh, Maloney, Jason Maloney. I like, uh, I like it all. I'll take it. You there, Mike? I was on mute. I'm sorry, I was just running out when my mouth was on mute and paying attention to the other thing. I told you I was distracted by this battle. But I was saying was, look, um, I'm not mad that Andrew Maloney lost because how you know he 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 showed himself to be a tough guy even in defeat. He did some good things, and I hope that Top Rings bring both of them back soon, particularly Jason because he's not just in he's not good enough right he's not only just good enough to he's not only good enough to com, be competitive against the world champion i think that depending on who he they put him in the ring with i think he's good enough to win a world title uh, uh right now at the very least uh he fought well enough that fans would want to see him again because he has a good package in there in terms of uh boxing ability and power. Uh, fans like to see that, particularly in these times where uh, uh, fight fans are just desperate to see uh, uh, fighters in the ring and, and, and do battle. 
um, because fighter because the fans are desperate to see fighters do battle. I'll go to you, Gail. Sometimes you just have to put up with just fights where it's just pretty much meh. You pretty you know what's going to happen even before the opening bell rings, and you just put yourself through it just because it's on television. We saw that in Mexico City uh, this past weekend as Miguel Burchell, who has a WBC title at 130 pounds, uh, fighter got about a fighter by the name of Valenzuela. And you knew that this was basically a glorified sparring session. It turned out to be that way. Um, Burchell came out hot early, uh, put Valenzuela down towards the end of the first round with a, uh, a hook, left hook. Look, Valenzuela, he showed himself tough to be in, in rounds two through five. He fought on the front foot. But uh, Burchell showing the guile and the experience and the professionalism of, of a guy who's had uh, many, many fights and is a world champion. He stayed his he stayed the course and kept his cool until he just punished. Uh, uh, he just let the uh, series of shots just wear on Valenzuela, and it all accumulated in round six where he just basically took him out. So this was a sparring session. This was ho hum. This was just yeah. Let's talk about Burchell going forward, Gail. Uh, the hot name in terms of his future opponent is uh, uh, Valdez. I know Jojo Diaz has called called him out on Twitter, said he would love to fight him. You still got Jamel Herring out there. If you were his handlers, Gail, where would you what would you like to see? What direction would you take for Chill? You know, they're all good options. I think Herring would have enormous trouble with him. Although he's very disciplined, it would he would need to make it a bit of a boring fight, uh, which would be very, very difficult with Burchell. The one I think we all want to see because they would be willing to go to absolute war is Oscar Valdez. You know, we know Valdez can fight through a lot. He is. It, had, it, it, had, it would be no choice because Burchell, yeah. as good as he looked tonight, we all know he can be hit. And, and Valdez, he act like he uh, has a phobia against defense. Now, <laughs> that's really true. Well, yeah, they they would. You know, this would be for their for their honor, for the flag. They, you know, I think they really tie into each other. You know, leading up to the fight would be a lot of fun. Um, you know, there's an interesting story. You know, here's um, a kid who's essentially, um, you know, a, a DACA kid, uh, Valdez. Um, you know, fighting somebody who's, you know. Um, still a Mexican citizen in Burchelt, you know, it is a very interesting dynamic there, but, but it is a full on Mexican versus Mexican, you know, uh, Mexican on Mexican violence, you know, my favorite kind personally. So I, I think that would be a barn burner. I'm not sure we deserve it right now in the pandemic. Um, I'd like to see what Valdez looks like. Um, again, coming off this period of, you know, for a lot of these guys of inactivity, you know, we're not quite sure where they're at. I imagine Valdez has stayed in pretty good shape, though. He he's you know made, he's maintains his fitness pretty well. He's had some terrible injuries. You know, he was off for so long with the broken jaw after Scott Quigg tagged him. I I think they he does not because he had to sit out so long to let the jaw rehab. He's not inclined to sit on his ass, you know, when he's in, you know, fit enough to be in the gym. So I imagine they both be ready fairly soon. And I would not put it past Bob Aram to schedule the fight in the middle of September on Mexican Independence Day if Canelo doesn't take that date. And I'm not sure he will. And so Bob's been willing to swoop in on that date before. And wouldn't Burchelt Valdez make a dandy Mexican Independence Day fight? I would love that. I go to you, Daniel. The fight was, you know, yeah, who cares? We all know what was going to happen. Future of Burchelt, where do you see him going?
we, we all knew what it was. We all knew what that what that what that sparring match was. But as far as the future, this is going to be interesting to Rachel because he obviously has a lot of options at one thirty. He could go up to one thirty. Any foolishness happens with the uh, whole Loma. They said Loma uh, and Teofilo Lopez. If there's anywhere he he's a good alternate for either one guy. Jojo Diaz would be pretty interesting, and we know it, it would it would be a fight that would be interesting to see, see who would get the rights to it. Would ESPN get the? It might be both a Zamfer and a Golden Boy Promotions fight. That's the tricky part, but probably the most probable and likely the best opponent would be Valdez. It would be bloody entertaining. And this would probably be the best test as what Burchelt has learned, at least on the defensive end. Not, not sorry, not Burchelt. Valdez, what they learned on the, on the defensive end when it came to being in the Reynoso camp. Because that's the good part about it. He's probably been well-disciplined in that area. So that's probably the best opponents when it comes to him. But just keep an eye on lightweight. Just keep an eye on any pass of like the Loma Teofimo matchup to fall through. Because he would be a good Good ultimate for either one. And 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 given how uh let's just face it, how he has a tendency to put on um some pounds in between fight. I mean, we all saw how big he looked when him and uh um, Herring uh, uh had that meeting in the ring after Herring's last fight. Uh, uh he looked let's just be kind and say beefy. Uh <laughs> Burchell, he looks like he has the frame to move up to 130 pounds, 35 pounds, 135 pounds, rather easily. And he's, I believe he's already talked in the past about moving up and, and, and trying to uh, tangle with uh, uh, Lomachenko. So, yeah, if the fight between Lomachenko and, and Lopez falls through, I wouldn't be surprised if Arrow put Burchell right in there. Right in there. Um, I'm going back to you, Daniel, to talk to start the news segment. And, um, yeah, there's a reason I named this episode from Big Baby to Big Bust, Big Busted, because um, Jarrell Big Baby Miller, a year after blowing an opportunity to get in the ring with Anthony Joshua do it as a result of testing positive for not one, not two, but three substances at the same time um, in the lead up to that bout, uh, he tests positive again. What? Why? How? Dumb on Big Baby's part, and you can tell he's how he. You can tell you know he knows he's wrong because he deleted his social media accounts on Twitter and as well as IG. So he's embarrassed. Uh, boxing fans are mad. What make of you with this? Two positive tests in a year span? And this is coming off of being suspended six years ago for a positive P PED test? Big baby, what's wrong with you, sir? Our test. Because in the Joshua fight, he felt three, I think. Three tests. Number four. In the span of a year, it it just throws a whole a whole question when it comes to Big Baby. Whether like even in the victories where he looked that strong, now you because of this to have to actually start questioning whether a good amount of his victories were valid. If you haven't stopped after losing your biggest money opportunity, 
that you could have had and make you to stop, that tells me you've probably have done it before and a lot longer than we know of. And it's the case. And just judging by the way he deleted all of his accounts, because he, he probably knows what's gonna happen. Much not to get he should not get an, another chance again. Uh, I don't know if it's something where the sanctioning bodies can suspend them indefinitely, or if something where any type of athletic commission have to revoke his license indefinitely. But as far as I'm concerned, he's done. He's done. There's no way you can redeem yourself from this. And this doing popping for steroids this frequently within a year. So it's done. I, I, you can give some type of credit to Bob Aaron for trying to give him a chance, but. It, it, it just big baby's going to be one of those situations of not only hey what if like what if he stayed clean how far would he have gone he was he ever clean to begin with indeed uh what ticks you off what ticks you off more gail uh, um will big baby keep popping popping up positive or, 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 or your boyfriend keeps tapping in his, hey, his hey, issues hey. in and out of the ring, hey, with hey. weight or otherwise. Hey, hey. <laughs> you just had to sneak it in there. I know, you know you did. You know, oh. And for those who know who don't know what I'm talking about when I say Gail's hey. boyfriend, I'm talking about Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Hey, yeah. Oh, he's just playing around. He's just having a good time at home. Um, no, no, ain't nothing wrong with a man trying to pair a pair of high heels on every now and then. Come on. <laughs> let's get the big baby what the hell was he thinking this guy has got to be hiding some serious insecurities flaws he clearly does not believe in himself because he can't let go you know a little chemical help and he damn well knew, he must have known he's not a stupid man at all, otherwise, that he was going to be scrutinized, he was going to be tested, you know, he was sort of on his last chance, the last chance of all the last chances. He was got a horrible reputation that he needed to um, prove, prove himself that he could stay clean, but he's clearly an addict. You know, all of us who've dealt with addicts, you know, God forbid among your family and friends, you know, they promise you hope, they promise you hope, and then they break your heart again. And you have to decide at some point, when do you give up on them? You know, when they're your family or someone close to you, you just can't, even though you know, you know, that they're really going to struggle and inevitably, you know, like it's like more likely than not, this is going to happen. But what I have to ask myself is, at, did nobody in his camp know? I mean, was there absolutely no one around him who knew about this? Where's he getting this stuff? I mean, what, where's the failure there? anyone to try to protect him from himself he, he was really hell-bent on destruction like this i think he's done i mean if i'm bob arum i am furious with him absolutely furious you know probably mad at myself as much as i'm mad at him i mean seriously the only thing i can even think of that he could possibly do right now he better pick up the phone and call vince mcmahon because i think that's about it for him I'm, look, all fighters, or let me, how can I put this? A lot of athletes take uh, 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 substances. Um, so I'm not mad at that. If you want to make an argument, well, uh, a lot of fighters are taking 
maybe taking performance enhancing this and that. Okay, fair enough. If you want to make that argument, particularly when it comes to physical sports like boxing and whatnot, okay, fair enough. I, even though I will push back against that argument. The problem with Big Baby is, is that one, he can't seem to get his hands off of substances that uh, uh, will pass a, a, a VADA or any kind of strict drug test, A. Um, B, if you want to say that fighters, all fighters take some kind of, take something or whatever to get themselves through, well, do you know the other side of that? A lot of these fighters, if they take it, they seem to pass these tests. Big Baby doesn't. So that's my frustration. He he's a habitual he's a, a habitual line stepper, line crosser, um, and he does this while while running his mouth and talking about other fighters and what they may or may not be doing. You cannot sit there and and, and talk about a Joshua maybe doing this and accuse Joshua of doing that, accuse Wilder of doing this and that while you fail when you fail a test and then turn back around you get your opportunity you keep running your mouth again and then you fail again that's not how it works you lose credibility you lose respect and even if he were to come back and try to and and, and write the ship uh your believability factor is not going to be there with you because most think most folks think that you're not honest you're not on it up and up. Most people will think that he's passing now, but what it was, but he's passing now, but it must be something he he's taking to mask what got him what got him um catching dirty before. So so that's my problem. The believability factor is not there with him anymore. The trust factor is not there with him anymore. And if the powers that be uh, when it comes to these state athletic commissions, the power that be in the sport does not give him a lengthy suspension. I'm questioning them as well because this is three, four occasions now that he's tested positive and out of his career twice in a year span. They can't do it. No, no. He got to go and he got to go now and he got to go for a considerable amount of time. Um I don't know how long that is, a year, two years, three years, whatever, but this is completely unacceptable. And I'll just leave it up to you guys for the final word on this because I've ran it enough, I ran my mouth enough, and let y'all finish this off. It's just a horrible shame, you know, but he did it to himself. He did it to himself. He's got no one else to blame. I don't know how you look yourself in the mirror. I really don't after you've done something like this. And so many of us were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and he blew it. So, you know, the old saying, fool me once, fool me twice. He's fooled us all about five times. We're done. Let's put it, <laughs> let's put it to this. Or like I said, suspension should be indefinite. He should be done. He should not be allowed to step foot in a box of a way again. But Gail did throw the idea there when it comes into it. He may not step foot in the wrestling ring anymore. He does have the mouth to probably step foot in the wrestling ring, though, and that might be his only shot now. Oh, absolutely. that is it. I mean, if he wants to get in front of a crowd and he wants to play the villain, you know, the bad boy, the bad baby, uh, there, there is, there's a market for that. He'd get away with that. I'm serious. Vince, you know, Vince should be expecting his call. Vince should call him. Yeah, and, and, and given the kind of person that Vince McMahon is, he will embrace, he will embrace him with um, open arms because he just, he just, he just don't give a damn like that. Um, let's move on to one other development well actually a development that's affecting uh, uh two different folk two different individuals that's associated with the sport um at the end of last week's episode we talked about how we was going to uh, uh preview jamel herring and his upcoming who's going to make the first defense of his second defense of his title right well um 
in the days after the episode ended last week on the 22nd, um, Herring announced on in, on Twitter that he had uh, tested positive for uh, coronavirus. Um, Thursday, um, while uh, Jason Maloney was uh, beating up on Baez, uh, news broke that um, uh, I caught, in my opinion, uh, a multiple time, multiple division uh, a world champion, uh, Roberto Duran, had contracted uh, uh, COVID-19 coronavirus as well. His son announced it on, on social media. I wrote about it for Three Kings Boxing. You can check that out on threekingsboxing.com. Um, so if anyone, for anyone who wants to respond, Gail, Daniel, uh, whoever wants to respond first, they're fine by me. Talk about how this pen, how this virus is continuing to have an impact on the sport, continuing to rear its ugly head, even as society in large and how boxing in specifically is trying to make its uh, uh, comeback and adjust in adjusting to this pandemic. Well, the testing is working because statistically it, it would be more unbelievable if absolutely nobody in the bubble, all these guys coming through or their teams were if every um, interruption, Gail, um, side note to a certain dude in the White House, see what happens when you actually get more tests instead of trying to denounce them. Yeah. You find out who has what. I'm just saying, proceed. Yeah. And then you trace them, you isolate them, you stop them from infecting everybody else or go into the bar down the street. Um, and you take action. How about that, Mr. Tang Man in the White House? Proceed, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Not to divert off into politics, but let's just remember we have a template on a smaller scale for getting stuff like this under control. It was during the HIV pandemic. What finally stopped it? Education, contact tracing, st you know, stopping the spread, knowing your status, right? Knowing Again. Your status. Again, how about that to the folks in the in the White House? Proceed, Gail. Yeah, there we go. We bought enough time so that, you know, we never have found a vaccine against HIV, but we now have treatments that make it just, you know, amazingly another chronic disease. For those of us old enough to remember it being a death sentence, that's amazing. Let me continue. Uh, what I do find interesting, however, about all of this, um, everybody who we know about in the boxing universe through top rank through the program um, or others like roberto duran who have uh tested positive for the virus none of them have seemed to be catastrophically ill in fact most of the athletes themselves are shocked to find out they're positive it tells me that people who are at the peak of their fitness may have an edge fighting this off or their immune systems are strong. You know, that is something that we should all take to heart and stay in as good a shape as we can. Uh, and you want to talk to your man, Michael, about that, our trainer right here. So I'm just saying, but clearly it, it can't hurt and it might be helping a lot. And even with Duran, you know, he's, you know, older, of course, he, I believe was hospitalized, but it looks like he's going to come through. So once again, you know, it seems to give them a little bit of an edge against that. And, you know, we can take all the edge we can get, you know, best wishes to um, Senor Duran that he comes through this. He, he looked like he was toughing it out. You know, he's a, he's a tough bastard. And I say that with all due respect and affection. So I, I think he'll, I think he'll weather it for the rest. You know, it's just been really interesting to see them bounce right back. Um, and then they're getting right back in the rotation. In fact, we're going to have a card coming up here. That's, uh, you know, going to uh, put all these folks right back on the card. You're going to have Michaela Mayer back. You're going to have Jamel back. Um, and that's good news for them, but uh, we should be more suspicious if they weren't finding anybody. To me, this says the system in place is working. 
¿Y otro a este año? Well, it, the system is working in the sense of the fact that you are getting the you are getting seeing people that are testing positive, but you're also seeing that the frequency of how many people are testing positive, particularly with top rank cards, almost every top rank card has had somebody, whether it's a boxer, a manager, a trainer. Wow, wow, like Jamal Herring, just like the latest one now, that has to bow out of a fight because of the situation. And it's a situation where we can't control it because a lot of these guys are not going to be in that Vegas bubble completely all the time. They're going to be in their home states and they're going to put themselves inside the bubble when it comes to the, to the fight. And that's very, very dangerous depending on what state you're in. Like we talked about last week when it comes into it. It's, it is show like you, hopefully it stays at this point where it's just only like, like one or two PR. But if it grows, if it explodes the way it has college football, for example, like like your, your team, like they, your team, Team Clemson, I think, went from what ten people in the span of from, two, it, two yeah, and a half it weeks. Went, it went from initially twenty three, now is up to thirty seven, and that's just what's been reported. It's probably more. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we're hoping. That's not going to happen when it comes to. Do. I hope we don't read. It's a point where a third step out into it. Yes, the test the testing is working. We're catching these this situation as, as it's happened. What I worry is that if it grows back long enough, it then starts to reflect what's happening everywhere else. And if you notice over the weekend, Texas had to reverse. More either pause or many are reopening. New Jersey today. Pause any plans for indoor indoor dining and they have pause they didn't say like what are you gonna try to come with? They paused it indefinitely. We and then we were frankly what what type of shit show Florida is right now. So it's it's very worrisome, but they're catching it. They're not pre they're preventing it from spreading to other people. I just hope that just there isn't as huge of an outbreak later in the rest of the country. Um, as an aside, uh, uh, Daniel, you just mentioned um, Florida. Uh, given how this is not even boxing related, so I'm gonna stray off here uh, for a quick second. Given how you cover uh, uh, NBA particularly the Heat, your thoughts on the NBA continuing to go on as planned with this, with the season in this bubble, quote unquote, in Orlando, in spite of the rising numbers of, of, of COVID um, in that state, or throughout that state, I should say. The plan is half baked. It's the wrong state to do it in. The logical thing to be would be to just sh shut it down. To just start preparing for the next season. That's the logical thing to do. Unfortunately, the main reason why a lot of sports is coming back and everything is relating to money. A lot of these companies, promotions, they cannot run. A a full year, some type of revenue. And in boxing, we're seeing it because there's the promotion starting to come back. They're taking their, they're making their due diligence. They can, but it's still because they have to come back. They have to find a way to make money it goes into it. With the NBA, it's a two-fold street. Said that fans' participation, whether it's gates, concessions, everything makes up 40%. 
of league revenue, the owners, they're trying to recoup as much of that 60, other 60% as they can. And with the players, what people don't know is that a lot of people don't, outside of like good, a good amount of media members, people in the league, is that the players are actually nervous that if the season doesn't start, this is an excuse for the owners to get out of the collective bargaining agreement that they currently have. And that could turn a situation where, okay, we pause due to a pandemic. It could turn into a very prolonged lockout. Players that are, get, that are due Supermax deals pretty soon, like Giannis said to the Gumpo, and, that could, and everything that's happening right now, he may actually get that Supermax. But like it, in all, all honesty, like I said, if it were, if we can, logically, no sport would come back. At least until like the late fall or winter. Money talks. Piggybacking off of what Daniel just said, Gail, do you think it's the situation, the same situation with boxing? Uh, folks continuing to have this on uh, 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 all over because, as Daniel just said, money talks. Well, these guys have got to salvage something to stay alive. It's like every business, we're not running in optimal conditions, a lot of them, but they'd rather have a little bit of something than nothing. They're losing the gate. They're losing the concessions. But for most of the major sports, um, boxing slightly less so. It's all about salvaging that TV revenue, that broadcast revenue. That's a big chunk for a lot of them. You know, the truth is the major sports in the United States um, would gladly, you know, slink away this year as long as they can salvage those big, big broadcast dollars. And they've got to put content on somehow to get that, even an abbreviated season, they'll still get to kick that in. You know, boxing, you know, thankfully has diversified a little bit more as far as its um, media streams go and where their money comes from. So they've got a tiny bit more flexibility and they are in a position where they're having to wrangle less people. I mean, that that's the big issue, you know, the just like those of us in our personal lives, we're safer when we have contact with fewer limited people. So boxing is better able to manage that. You know, if you're going to have 100 people aside when you think of all the personnel you need to run an NFL game, you know, 200 people minimum, not even counting broadcast crews or stadium crews or anybody else you need in there, it's going to be every bit of 300 people. Boxing has been able to do it with probably 50 and not even all those 50 together in one place at one time. You just do the math. You know, I would think the NBA might be able to get it together. You know, interesting to me, I've started thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, the guys that play the NHL, you know, they've got, masks and helmets on, most of them, aren't, aren't they going to be a little bit better off? <laughs> I mean, if breathing a little bit less of that COVID air, um, you'd think that they could finish off their season. And I think they will. But everybody else, man, I think they're in dire straits. And who in the world thought it was a good idea to all head down to Florida? Boy, what a mess. You know, it just shows you really for all we complain about, uh, you know, non-competitive fights and, oh, these cards aren't that great. We're, you know, we're not seeing a lot of the highest level stuff. The fact that it's happening at all, you know, it's kind of a miracle when you really think about it, especially given, you know, what a mess we've made of these things in the United States. And we could veer back into politics there, but I think I'll stop it right now. <laughs> um, let's well, move on. That's what we want to say, I think we can leave it unsaid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a bit of breaking news, Daniel. In terms of the question I asked you about the NBA, uh, just check out the uh, 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 private chat. 
Um, let's move on to start to shut things down here by talking about some vice that's happening this week. I'm going to focus on a couple to be specific. Um, I don't know much about the uh, one fighter in this fight, admittedly, so I'm going to rely on y'all. Uh, tomorrow night, I believe it is, that uh, Alex Alcedo fighting um, Sonny Fredrickson. Um, I'll go back to you, Gail. I'm not as familiar on Fredrickson as I should. My apologies for that. Uh, but uh, talk about the fight itself. If, you, if you're familiar with Fredrickson, talk about him and the fight against Alcedo. So this is a fight that actually was scheduled to happen uh, before the pandemic and got shut down and is, has been resurrected. This was originally on the calendar for April. Um, Fredrickson is kind of out of that Ohio boxing scene. He's um, out of Toledo. Um, he's a little bit bigger than Salcedo. Um, he's got a shot. Uh, he says he's going to use range and distance because he is taller uh, than his opponent. Um, he's fought, uh, he's fought, you know, some top 10 type guys. It's, it's not the, it's not the worst matchup in the world. I, I would say of Fredrickson, I expect him to give a good effort. I expect him to, to do his best to make it competitive. Do I think he's going to win? Eh, I really don't. I don't think this is a Plania or a Joshua Franco. Uh, your, your, your thoughts, um, um, your thoughts, Daniel, for those who are not familiar with um, Salcedo, do yourself a favor uh, and check out his fight with Lenny Z from last year. Uh, uh, was it last year? No, 2018, I'm sorry. Uh, um, one of the best fights of that year, just a real treat. Um, round four in particular, that fight, uh, one of the best, more graphic and gory rounds in the best way, I'll say that, uh, that you will ever see. But uh, Daniel, for, uh, any comments on this fight between Salcedo and, 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 and Fredrickson? I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see good things from Salcedo. Uh, hopefully this is not a pattern that he he'll break the pattern that a lot of these top rank cards had where we know we've had an opponent that's on the rise that should be coming up and suddenly they get upset. Like I mentioned, Joshua Greer. There's been a little bit of run lately, but I think he'll be able to do it. I have not heard much about the opponent. I I was starting to watch video, like I said, before we got on, but from the sound of things, from what I'm hearing, this should be a pretty good fight for Salcedo. Uh, that fight happens on Tuesday, tomorrow, the 30th. Um, on the on Thursday, July 2nd, um, this fight is being moved up to main event status as um, Les Pierre, uh, who fought Maurice Hooker, um, Mikhail Lesbier, he's fighting Jose Padraza, Padraza, who uh, defeated Beltran uh, to win the uh, WBO title at 135 pounds uh, a couple of years ago, I believe it was. He gave a good account of himself in a loss to uh, Lomachenko. I think he was stopped in 11 rounds. Um, gave Loma some difficulty early on in that fight in particular. Uh, Pedraza is moving up from 135 pounds to 140 uh, uh, to engage in the showdown. I'll go back to you, Daniel. Pedraza, in my opinion, is the better boxer. Uh, Les Pierre is the taller and, and, and bigger fighter. Uh, the question for me is how will how how will Pedraza fare at a new weight division against a bigger and stronger guy if he can deal with the size of Les Pierre? Uh, I think he will be able to uh, outbox Les Pierre. If not, he could be in some trouble here. What weight is it? This fight is at 140 pounds at Junior Welterweight. What weight class is this fight again? I forgot. Well, Junior Welterweight. Oh, okay. Yeah. For, yeah. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. That that's gonna be interesting with Pedraza. 
because he's a he's a fighter that more on skill than power to win his fights and lightweight wasn't exactly a, let's put it this way it wasn't exactly a picnic for him so jumping into the to another weight class again it's going to be interesting to see but pedraza is probably is smart enough to probably win the fight like it's like he wins his fights more on he does on power so it's going to be just to see how it's going to how it's going to happen and if he's able to pull it off he'll be a, then he'll be a t tough foul for a good amount of fighting at 140 but it depends how he wins uh, what say are you about this about Gail? Because uh, of the fights that we've seen uh, um, since uh, Top Rex returns, um, this may be the most one of the most intriguing, uh, one of the most even on, on paper, at the very least. Right. You know, it, it appears to be super well matched, super competitive. You know, but we've been really surprised before. You know, the the um, unusual nature of the preparation, you know, the fact that this was sort of a stop and start situation too. These guys were ready to go. You know, luckily they've gotten right back on the schedule. But, you know, when you're, you're sort of perfectly timing everything uh, to get yourself ready and then suddenly the rug yanked out from under you. you know, admittedly, in this case, it was only a, literally days. Um, you know, so days. So, will that rattle either of these guys? We don't know. In, in a normal, non-pandemic universe, these two matched, you know, you're going to go with Pedraza every time. Did, did this rattle his cage? Did this shake LePierre enough up to where he realizes, you know, he kind of got a new lease on things. Um, put a little fuel in his tank. Who knows? You know, but a fight well worth watching, especially given our expectations again in, with, with what we've got to work with. Um, it's a fight I'm looking forward to seeing. I, I'm actually looking forward to seeing this Comain more than the main event. And that's been true on several of the cards. Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, the, uh, in terms of going back to uh, uh, um, Salcedo, uh, do yourself a favor and look at his fight with um, Lenny Z. Also check out his fight with uh, uh, Maurice Hooker, which a lot of people felt he was going to win. Put oh, Hooker down um, in the fight. second round in that bout, <laughs> uh, was taking the fight to him. And then, yeah, <laughs> things kind of fell apart for him. At that point, is uh, Hooker found it with power, and and, and um, eventually stopped him. So those are two fights. If you, for those who have not seen um, Alex Salcedo fight, so and, and I, I think we're going to um, start to uh, end the showdown on that note. Um, I want to thank those who join us in the live chat. Uh, uh, Sean, um, again, big shout out to Jacob, um, who, as I said at the beginning of the show. Uh, due to his new uh, job that he has, uh, the hours that he has on that job, he will not be able to uh, be a part of the show uh, for the foreseeable futures. But um, so again, uh, congratulations on that job, and we hope him wish him nothing but the best. Uh, I'll go around to the panel here, begin the show with ladies first, um, end the show with ladies first. Gail for Communities Digital News for those who want to uh, talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk, uh, discuss media. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you. Well, you can find me in my regular column on Community Digital News, which is com, D-O-M-M, Digi, D-I-G-I, News, com, Digi, News, dot com. Or you can find me hanging around with Harvey and Charles on PMZ Live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Gail's becoming a bit of a regular on, 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 on TMZ Live right now. So, uh, 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 Spotlight, the profile is up and for, so be sure to check her out there. there and um, <laughs> since I always say I begin and end the show starting with ladies first, um, 
let me say if you are a, a, a woman who is a boxing fan or in media or a blog about boxing or anything like that, I, I am looking for folks to be part of the latest edition of my Ladies Love Boxing special episode, Pound for Pound Boxing Report. We usually do it by now, but because of circumstances that are outside of our control, like this pandemic and whatnot, I have not been able to uh, have and record that episode. So uh, if you're a woman um, who are who is a fight fan, who follows the sport, who covers the sport, uh, please reach out to me on my um, on Power for Power Box Report Twitter page. That is at P4P Box Report. Uh, and uh, uh, leave me a message or uh, tag me in a comment. If you want to take part, please hit me up. Um, I'll go to Daniel for those, for those who want to talk boxing with you. And for those who want to talk to the NBA, especially when it comes to Miami Heat, um, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, yes, folks, you can follow me on Twitter, Ruckus99, R A W K U Z 99. Definitely talking a lot of sports and uh, I filter when it comes to certain things. But definitely catch us on. And yes, like we like we mentioned in the beginning, listen to us on everywhere Spotify, iTunes, Mike's interview with Kathy Duva. I heard a little bit. Bits of it as we're watching the show going into it does show, like I said, how much Kathy Duba like has learned from her husband and some gems in there. And because this could be the era where we see the regional promoters come back. Yeah, indeed, indeed. She'd say, yeah, that I'll please be sure to check that out on iTunes and Spotify and all uh all other uh, podcast platforms um, conducted that interview with her uh, this past Friday on the 26th. Uh, uh, I put it up on the 20, 27th. I'll say that late, late, late on the 27th, early on the 28th. I spent late, late into that night. Um, updating everything on pound for pound box report so all previous episodes you can find on itunes you can find on spotify google play music google podcast spreaker uh, uh stitcher um everywhere else so um yeah please be sure to check that out and i'll eventually get around to uploading the video portion of that interview on the pound for pound box report uh, uh youtube channel for those who want to talk box with me who for those who want to talk fitness uh for those who want to talk music and by the way um I mentioned how I may be distracted by the versus battle. Um, Fab, it wasn't a good life. It wasn't a good night for you in terms of that versus battle. Uh, Jada Kiss, um, yeah, yeah, he 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 caught a body that night. He caught a body tonight. Yeah, he he had his way with fabulous toward that battle. I just have to say that. Uh, get back to the boxing ish. Uh, for those who want to talk boxing, music, fitness, you know what it is on Twitter. Uh, Brother JR at Brother JR76. That's the personal. You can also check out the blog page, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com, where you can find top right of the blog page. You can find links to where to find us all over social media, um, where you can donate, uh, where you can check out my online fitness page. And please be sure to check out my online fitness coaching page. Um, and so, yeah, um, episode 291 is in the books. I do not know if we'll do an episode next week because that's around the july 4th holiday and quite frankly next week uh not much is happening boxing wise kind of a dry spell so i may t observe the fourth and, and take that week off i'll let you know um when we do if we did take that week off for sure on the next episode we will talk about jamel herring his bout has been rescheduled against a kendo for the 14th um there's a card also on the 16th as well uh, so we'll talk about those two bouts to be for sure, I should say. So, yeah, uh, for Gail, uh, for Jacob, I mean, it's not for Jacob, but Daniel, this is your host, Michael. This has been episode 291, Pound for Pound Box Report. Um, everybody have a good evening, good night. And I forgot to, it didn't get, it didn't appear on the show last week. I said uh, uh, justice for Breonna Taylor. You want to mention justice for who, Daniel? Unmute yourself. For Breonna Taylor, justice for George Floyd. That's just, I am I am unmuted. 
As it was somebody Chile, else who you said last week. I, I didn't get to hear. I think it's Alejandro Armando Guardero. There you go. Yeah. So I think it's Armando Guardero, 18 year old kid. 18 year old kid killed by LA sheriffs. For no so reason. There you, so there you go. There you go. So, yeah. Episode 291, Pound for Pound Box Report. Everyone have a good evening. Good night.